Today, I'm doing my first ever collaboration with another YouTuber. Check out his channel, Epsilon is Greater Than. We are introducing the O'Neill Cylinder. Is this old concept still the best idea for future space habitats? My name is Chris, and welcome to Science Talk TV. There's been a lot of talk lately about colonizing the moon or Mars, but would it make more sense to live in deep space? That's where the O'Neill Cylinder comes in. The adventurer in me wants to go to deep space. Can you quickly explain the O'Neill Cylinder? It's basically an enormous space station that rotates to create artificial gravity. It was first proposed in the 1970s by physicist Gerard O'Neill and is cylindrical in shape, thus the name. The idea was to make a space station so large that the people inside could live as if they were on Earth, rather than in cramped quarters like you have in today's spacecraft. The rotation of the cylinder would need to be fast enough to create enough centrifugal force to simulate gravity, but not so fast that it caused motion sickness. In order to achieve this balance, the station would have to be very large. O'Neill's original proposal was for a cylinder 5 miles in diameter and 20 miles long, rotating about once every two minutes. The science fiction TV series Babylon 5 was set in an O'Neill cylinder, though they never called it that in the show. The movie Interstellar also has an O'Neill cylinder orbiting Saturn. It's called Cooper Station, and it looks beautiful. What are the real-world challenges? The biggest problem is the sheer scale of the thing. We'd have to build up to a project of this size by building space infrastructure and industry first. The first O'Neill cylinders would be wondrous projects like building the great cathedrals of Europe or the great pyramids of Egypt. But additionally, in order to start such a project, we'd need to learn to create artificial ecosystems in enclosed environments. So far as I know, no, no such environment has been created in a scale large enough for humans to occupy. A self-sustaining ecosystem actually becomes easier with size. Would you agree that Earth is a closed system? Earth has been sustaining life for over 4 billion years. Biosphere 2 failed because it was too small. It was only 161,000 cubic meters in size. And the O'Neill cylinder that you're proposing would be 102 million cubic meters, making it 636 times larger. If we could exactly emulate life on Earth in a greenhouse on a spaceship, it should theoretically work. Life can be very, very difficult to snuff out given enough space and time. The biosphere projects were so small that any failed crop, human error, or disease was catastrophic. This makes me really like the size of the proposed O'Neill cylinder. Do you think it's better to build a fleet of these or just one even bigger cylinder? I think the optimum size of the cylinders would depend what we learn about building artificial ecosystems. You want to build large enough to have a stable environment inside, but not really much larger. The larger you build, the more difficult it is to maneuver the station if needed or to do major maintenance. Yeah, having multiple smaller cylinders would be a great way to reduce the impact of a catastrophe, be it biological or maybe even a space junk impact. Safety in numbers would certainly mitigate disaster. A big advantage of a high-tech space colony is that we could properly control population. We wouldn't have to run into the same old ecological and environmental problems that are destroying Earth today. Okay, these space stations will obviously be very expensive, take hundreds of years to build, and be a multi-generation project. Is it really worth it to even build these at all? I think that living in space has major advantages over living on planets. Specifically, anyone living on a planet is trapped in what we call a gravity well. This means that it takes a large amount of energy to lift anything on a planet out of the planet's gravitational field to get it into space. Also, it takes a lot of work to lower anything from space to the planet's surface safely. Gravity wells are why this would be so hard to build in the first place. The International Space Station is only about as big as an American football field but it took 30 launches to assemble. 
Building an O'Neill cylinder would require thousands of Earth launches, even using today's biggest rockets. This would be a huge undertaking. Well, we couldn't build this until we opened up the bulk of the solar system to mining. The materials to build the O'Neill cylinders would come from asteroid mining, so that they wouldn't have to be launched from a planet's surface. Anyone who was lucky enough to live in an O'Neill cylinder would have ready access to space and all the resources that would open up. Uh, yes, it would be a lot more efficient to mine from a source that doesn't have a huge gravity well, like the moon or comets. Um, for today's rockets, what percentage of fuel is wasted just to escape the Earth's gravity and air friction? Essentially all of it. What isn't lost to air resistance is used to get up to the speeds necessary to achieve orbit or escape velocity. Uh, that's only necessary, of course, if you start in a gravity well. Uh, once you're in space, it takes very little fuel to get around. Another advantage of living in space is that it would allow humanity to expand far beyond what's possible on the planets. There's enough material in the solar system to build enough deep space colonies so that it would dwarf the amount of land area of the planets. We're talking enough land area to house trillions or even quadrillions of people comfortably. That is interesting. A hollow cylinder would certainly maximize the area to density ratio. I could think that only a hollow sphere would actually be better, but we can't rotate a sphere to simulate artificial gravity around it uniformly. And Earth actually has the smallest possible surface area to mass ratio as defined by the surface area of a sphere. Isn't that correct? Earth is the opposite of hollow. Correct. And with humanity distributed among so many relatively small colonies, even a planetary-sized disaster wouldn't endanger the species as a whole. It would be a good failsafe. And it's been proven time and time again that humans are incapable of 100% sterility. That's because we're biological creatures ourselves, and we rely on bacteria to help us with our digestion. Plants and humans are all born with viruses, and they're covered in microbes. Even 10% of the human DNA came from viruses. These microbes can either be symbiotic or problematic. The best bet is to have multiple large-scale ecosystems and just let life thrive as it does on Earth. If there is enough genetic diversity in our ecosphere, the plants will evolve all by themselves to thrive in space by natural selection. That being said, we should definitely do our best to avoid bringing most pathogens into space. We can do this by vaccines and quarantines. We definitely don't want our space dwellers bringing something like HIV aboard. What plants do you think would work best for such a project? I would use algae to sink carbon and generate oxygen because algae grows very quickly and it doesn't waste energy or resources growing things like tree trunks or roots. Also, algae can be turned into rocket fuel or eaten as food in an emergency. Algae has a short lifespan and can evolve quickly. It is a single-celled organism which makes it easy to genetically engineer. For food, Selecting something like soybeans would be a good idea. They require low water, they can survive drought, and they provide a good source of protein. And remember, we need insects and microbes to break down and compost everything. The O'Neill cylinder really shouldn't be making a landfill or ejecting much waste into space because we'd have to go out and remine all of those resources. Let's assume our O'Neill cylinder is in a similar orbit to Earth so we can take advantage of the sun and photosynthesis. How would you power the station? Do you think we could use a transparent material like glass, which would allow light in for photosynthesis? Or would it be better to use a metal and internal artificial lights? Well, O'Neill's original design had large windows to let in the light, but it might be more practical to enclose the entire system and use artificial light. If we've developed fusion power by then, we could use that to power the lighting. 
Otherwise, we could set up large solar panels outside the station to provide power. I like the idea of artificial lights. It'll make all life on our station less stressed if we can simulate the day-night cycles that are needed for a normal circadian rhythm. As a biologist, I know water is going to be our most essential resource. We need it to drink, grow our plants, provide oxygen, and make rocket fuel. Do you know about electrolysis? Yes, that's where you use electricity to split water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen, right? Yeah, compressed hydrogen is actually the most mass-efficient rocket fuel. For combustion, we need heat, oxygen, and a fuel source. Hydrogen is the first element on the periodic table. It's the lightest thing in the universe, and it just happens to be combustible. On the International Space Station, water is currently being recycled at about 93% efficiency, but with a bigger station like our O'Neill cylinder, I think we could get very close to 99%. Where would you mine water? The outer solar system. There's a lot of water in the form of ice in the comets and Kuiper Belt objects out there, and it's not inside any gravity well of any significant size, so we should use that. So what do you think? Is it plausible that we'll build and live in O'Neill cylinders at some time in the future? Yeah, I think so. It seems to be the most realistic way to have a self-sustaining habitat in space. It'll take a lot of resources to get started, but once we have several habitats, I think humanity can become an interstellar species. Do you think it's possible? I think we could build O'Neill cylinders eventually once we've built up the infrastructure to support it. But first we're going to want to colonize the moon and set up mining in the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt. Uh, going to the stars, that's another challenge entirely and a much more difficult one. I agree. A moon base is probably step number one. Earth's gravity well for bringing resources into space is just simply too expensive. Like you said earlier, fusion power technology needs to be mastered before we go interstellar. And it could be powered by water and electrolysis. My biggest question is if it is possible to mine or store enough water to power our station all the way to the nearest habitable planet, which is Proxima Centauri at 4.22 light years away. How long do you think it would take to go 4.22 light years with today's technology. The fastest object humans have launched into interstellar space is Voyager 1, which is traveling at 17 kilometers per second. Even at that tremendous speed, it would take 75,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri. Obviously, we're going to need something better if we're going to want to reach the stars in any kind of a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, a better rocket or a very renewable ecosystem and a whole lot of patience. Okay, this has been a good mind exercise. Yes, it's a pretty big topic. There's a lot more we could have talked about. Hopefully we can discuss more about space habitats in the future. Check out Epsilon is Greater Than's channel for cool whiteboard math and his new physics education series. I'll leave a link in the description below. What do you guys think about O'Neill cylinders? Could they work? Consider subscribing to Science Talk TV for new videos every Sunday about science education, science news, interviews, and cool animal facts. Thanks for watching Science Talk TV.